do you have any hope uh, that the Democratic Party itself could be a vehicle for progressive change at the federal level? And if so, how could that happen? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. It's probably that's the oldest question in the I history know. of uh, politics, right? Yeah. Um, it's been it's been asked uh, probably now for more than a century. Um, <sighs> and in fact, I wrote a book on this uh, called "The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party." And the basic premise of the book was that since the end of Roosevelt's presidency, since around 1944, there's been a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party, and that every time progressives, the left came close to getting control of the party, um, they were either shut down or if by chance they actually got the nomination like uh, McGovern in 72, then the party elites actually supported the other guy. Mm -hmm. There was a huge group in 1972 that I write about in the book called Democrats for Nixon. They just literally said, oh, you know, we've had this competition in our party. We lost. We're not going to support the guy that the members of the party nominated. And they undercut McGovern, you know, horribly in that in that campaign. And it's happened again and again. Yeah. And so one thing you have to understand is that the Democratic Party is a little bit like, you know, Lucy with the football and Charlie Brown. Right. You know, progressives are they come running to kick that ball and they get they work out, they get better at, you know, and everything. But Lucy always pulls it up. Um, and so then the question is, well, do you just say to Lucy, OK, we're not going to do this anymore. We're, we're leaving this this party. The problem with that is that the American political system is structured to favor a two-party system. And the bias in our system, both in our actual political processes, in the parties themselves, and in our media, is so overwhelming that um, to try and form an independent political force is very, very difficult. And so I have tended, but I'm not all the way here, I've tended to be in the camp that says, that um, trying to take over the Democratic Party, right, trying to move it to the left is not take it over, but trying to, you know, I, in fact, that's actually the wrong phrase. Let me use a different phrase. Let me say trying to give power to the base of the Democratic Party so that it can actually lead that party rather than the elites that, that operate in a few blocks of Washington, D.C., um, that that's still a worthy effort. Right. And as Michael Moore has said, in most of the United States, the Democratic Party is moribund, right? There isn't much there. And so you can kind of crawl into the shell and make it into something. Um, the, the reality is, of course, that you've got to do that better than it's been done up to this point, right? And I think that the Sanders campaign in 2016, especially, sort of shocked the party, right? It was, it was amazed that the, the elites were amazed that this thing happened. I think the media was amazed that this thing happened. And I think that, frankly, Sanders and the people around him were amazed that it happened. And it, it did so well that um, that had people known from the start that it was going to do as well as it was going to do, it probably would have taken over the party. Right. They probably would have succeeded. Um, but there was a lot of catch up there. By the time 2020 came around, the party was a lot of the party elites. The party establishment was was better prepared to, you know, see off a challenge from the left. And then you had COVID come, which really, you know, upset things in a lot of ways. All these negatives. But here's the interesting thing. What you should always worry about in politics is not whether you win yourself, but whether your ideas win. And what's fascinating is that on balance with Joe Biden on domestic policy, a lot of progressive ideas have won. Right. They have. He's been forced to the left on, on a lot of things. Not enough. I'm, I'm deeply unsatisfied. But what I'm saying is it's clear that when Biden wakes up in the morning, he says, well, I got to think about some of these things because there's people making noise about this. That wasn't, you know, when, when Clinton was there, when Bill Clinton was president of the United States, he woke up in the morning and said, well, what is Wall Street worried about? Right. right. And so something has shifted. The base of the Democratic Party has become louder and more effective, and it has had influence. And you see rising figures getting elected, members of the squad and others. But um, I, with all that said, and that trying to end on a slightly positive note, I will tell you, it is still, as I said in the book, a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party. And that is an ongoing fight. The elites, the powerful are very well organized and they know they're in an ongoing fight. Um, the left progressives, I think, kind of regroup every time. And, and I think are not always as aware that it is a, it's a permanent struggle. And that if you, if you take your eye off the prize for a moment, 
the elites are going to fill that space. Well, I, I think it's also a struggle where we have a winless record. So <laughs> you're, you're kind of looking around and you're going, I mean, for me personally, like speaking as an individual, you know, over the past eight years or so, you know, as somebody who, as soon as I was awake politically, I, I kind of went to the left, um, you know, and, and it was the Iraq war that, I mean, before the Iraq oh, yeah. war, I, I was pretty apolitical. I was just, you know, like just a kid playing in punk bands, hoping girls like me. And then the Iraq war happened. And, and Every, I, by the way, I'm going to stop you right there, brother. Every cool person in politics came out of a punk band. <laughs> just, that's, I mean, it's, and I mean, to touch on good, that. It's the clash and Billy Bragg, right? Yes. You know, and, and, you know, and a couple others. And, and, um, and, and so I just want to emphasize that, that I shouldn't say everyone that's unfair. There's obviously some people that were in ska bands, but the bottom line is that at some fundamental level, um, you come in, you, if you're going to bring to politics any more than just kind of the, the standard behaviors, right. Mm -hmm. You got to come from someplace else. Totally. Totally. Yeah. No, you know what? It's funny. I have a Joe Strummer t-shirt that I wear quite frequently. And uh, the other day I was wearing it and the only letters visible, I had a jacket on, the only letters visible were the T, the R, the U, and the M. So some people were confused by my t-shirt. Okay. <laughs> they were like, you. is that? And I was like, wait a uh, second. Yeah. I was like, I, the man, ironic thing. <laughs> this is the about roots of fall. a comedy routine here. You know, no, I know I am working on a bit about it because it's like, you know, the irony being like that that's about as far from a Trump T-shirt as one could possibly oh, yeah. wear. <laughs> like like what yeah. you think about it. Like so. But I guess like the frustration and I know like this conversation, we've been having it for generations. We're going to continue to have it yeah. where it's like for me personally, the past eight years have really just confirmed all my worst suspicions where it's like, I feel like the democratic party just does not want lefties anywhere near nope. it. And, and they don't. And, and nope. then you see, I mean, yeah, I was very, uh, you know, happy when squad members were getting elected. And I thought this is the start of something yet. You see them not work as a block and the frustrations that have happened because of that. You, we know you're grossly outnumbered, but you're not voting together. And that's what we need you to do if we want you to have any type of leverage. And so well, I, I feel like. And then it may all blow up again because they're now all going to be. Most they'll be targeted. Are going to be targeted this year yeah. because of Gaza. Yeah. Uh, and their stances on, stances on that. And so, you know, again, this gets to that that difficult reality where it's it's one step forward, two steps back. And, and politically, that's very, very frustrating. So the question always is, I mean, what do you do, right? Do you give up or do you go on? And of course, the answer is, we're going to go on. And uh, then how do you do it? Well, the thing that I suggest is they have less respect for political parties and more respect for the movements, right? And if a movement can, you know, get animated within a political party and, and make something happen, great. If it can't, then, you know, work from the outside to influence it. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who we will celebrate um, uh, in coming days and the, the anniversary of his birth, um, was a brilliant political strategist. And yet he very rarely did politics in, a, in right. a classic sense. He refused to make endorsements, right? He would just comment on elections. He didn't go out and campaign, you know, at Lyndon Johnson's side or something like that because he felt the civil rights movement was above that and and in fact in those days amazingly enough you had a lot of republicans that were very pro civil rights often more than many democrats and so king wanted to keep it there but he wanted to build a movement that was strong enough to influence the the body politic the bigger politics and so i i do think that that it is relevant to you know put energy into movements that seek to influence the whole of our politics right that and in this case, because of what's happened to the Republican Party, it's most likely that they influence the Democratic Party. But um, uh, I think that that it's totally relevant to say that the Democratic Party has failed on a whole bunch oh, yeah. of issues and that it's going to push people away. And so if you create a movement that's big enough, right, that's strong enough, then the Democratic Party comes to you rather than you going to the Democratic Party and begging. And and so I guess you know, up off bended knee and on to, you know, marching is the, is the way to go. And, and I do think that that's why we come back to labor. Yeah. Right. We started talking about labor and 
Uh, it frustrates me when labor unions endorse a political party early on or endorse a candidate early on. I think labor unions should be, you know, they should they should want to make sure that that uh, their endorsement is valued and it comes at the point where the party realizes that they need that they're needed, right? And so it's notable that at this point the UAW has not endorsed um, mm -hmm. in the presidential race, and they had reasons for that. And I think that's appropriate. I think that that um, ultimately unions should engage, and they it's fine, oh, it's absolutely. good to endorse. But um, if they hold back a little while and get a little more concessions, get a little more commitment, uh, I think that's a good thing. And I think, to my mind, that's something we're seeing with the rise of this new leadership in, in trade unionism, where union leaders are willing to, uh, and union activists, willing to hold back their endorsements until political candidates and political parties make it absolutely clear that when they get to power, they will you know, treat organized labor, not as a special interest, but as what it is, which is the, the, repre the representative voice of the working class in this country, right? Not the entire working class because not everybody's organized, but a voice that actually says we want a better a share for the working class. And so I, I, I guess if I had to say, you know, where, where is my hope, right? My hope is with the labor movement. Mm -hmm. And my ultimate hope as regards the labor movement is not just the labor movement get strong as regards bigger membership, you know, more plants represented, more stores represented, more communities organized, but that they get strong enough that the Democratic Party and maybe even some elements of the Republican Party are like, oh, we can't mess with these guys. Right. We have to we have to respect where this is coming from. And so uh, energy put into building up the labor movement, I think, is is one of the best, quote unquote, investments in a better politics. Uh, absolutely. A hundred percent. And and yeah, I, I personally, I hope that they do not endorse unless they get a, a list of concessions longer than a CVS receipt. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, like, like I think they should just, yeah. So I, I'm with you there. Well, let's talk, uh, let's transition a little bit into 2024. Sure. Um, you said that you've been massively disappointed by Joe Biden, which I agree with 110. Yeah. percent I think you're putting it diplomatically. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, you said that there were some areas, you know, where he was pushed left. I don't even think I, I don't think I would go that far. So, so what are some examples of of, of what you would call sure. some wins? Sure. Um, look, some of the appointments have been good. Um, okay. And so I'll start there. Uh, you know, I don't think you're going to do better than Katenji Brown Jackson for the Supreme Court. You know what I mean? And so let's let's recognize that that personnel and appointments, that's that's policy. Right. That's that's how you make things happen. And so I do think that that progressives have have gotten some powerful appointments, some good judicial appointments, uh, some good cabinet, po you know, people in, in positions of power that can can do some stuff. There's a struggle right now over uh, the secretary of labor position. And frankly, Biden's pick is a good pick. Um, but uh, so that's one one place to begin. The other thing is that when the Build Back Better fight went on, uh, at least initially, uh, there was very little question that, that Biden deferred to Bernie Sanders and was actually, you know, trying to work with Sanders on some of those issues. And, you know, they, they definitely got screwed over by, um, you know, Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema handful of others, and also by their own caution, frankly. They weren't willing to change the rules to get rid of the filibuster right. and to move on, on some of those things. And so in fairness, I, I think that that you could look at the early parts of the Biden administration and say, you know what, there was there were some things here that looked like they had real possibilities. I, I thought the initial Build Back Better plan, while not what I would have done, was pretty good, right? It, was, it, was, it had ambition there. Um, and it listened to the left rather than simply listening to the, the, the traditional sources of information. I remember how exciting it was to report about that in 2021, you know, in those early stages and, and just talking to activists who'd been at, at an issue for 10 years, 15 years, and were suddenly saying, yeah, I'm talking to the White House, right? But um, it hasn't come to fruition. So here's the, the areas where I, I would point my biggest disappointment. And, and that is not necessarily in policy. And I, and I understand people who would focus on policy, and I totally respect that. You know, there are things that I'm hugely disappointed that we haven't had, you know, federal action in a meaningful way to change policing yeah. 
and, and criminal justice, right? I'm deeply disappointed that, you know, we have not done enough on climate and climate, you know, we keep talking about it, but it keeps getting ahead of us. But oh, I'll yeah. give you, you know, those are policy ones. But let me give you some practical ones just on, on if you were sort of taking care of your own side, right? This is very, you know, pragmatic politics. The fact that Democrats had control of the House, Senate and the White House, and they didn't pass the PRO Act, they didn't make a, a situation, create a circumstance where or, labor could organize um, without all the barriers that exist, you know, could, could have a fair playing field, that that wasn't done immediately is jaw dropping, right? I mean, it's just, that's a failure. And when you finish a four year term and you have not made fundamental changes in uh, like labor law, to me, that's, that's an area of, you know, that's a that's a red alarm, right? That's a red alert of, of a big problem. Now, I will admit, as somebody who covers labor a lot, Biden's appointments to the NLRB and some of the other stuff he's done has been quite good. So there's there's been progress. I'm not I'm not denying it, and I certainly wouldn't suggest that if the Republicans were there, they'd be doing a better job. Not at all. Sure, sure. But what I am saying is that you know, come on, when you you, you come in, you've got that moment, you've got power use it immediately to create a fairer playing field so that then um you know those who frankly kind of i think agree more with a lot of your positions on the issues have more power to to express their views right they, they've got more of a traction and why doesn't that happen i fear you know that that there are elements of the democratic party that frankly don't want a, a well-organized uh grassroots right they don't want to they don't want to cede too much power outside of traditional politics, because if the movements get strong enough, that means they might not they might not be calling the shots anymore. And so the caution on that is what really frustrates.